interviews. People often get quite upset, rightly so, at the statistics for uh, autistic people in employment. Um, huge rates of being underemployed or being unemployed, but seeking, you know, desperately wanting work. Um, lots of autistic people, I think, end up self-employed, um, like myself, I suppose, um, as, as a way to avoid the various horrors and difficulties and stresses of the workplace. But interviews, that very opening part, that, that gateway into the world of employment is a huge, huge problem for autistic people, in my opinion, because they... I mean, they're barely even designed to help neurotypical people. You know, I suppose they're designed as a test. They're designed very... I mean, you know, <laughs> we, we talk about gatekeeping. I mean, interviews are the epitome of gatekeeping. And to some extent, for good reason. You know, the whole poor purpose of an interview is to make sure that the person is able to, to manage the stresses of the job and are they going to fit into the team and all that kind of thing. So I can understand, you know, there's a level of gatekeeping that's necessary. But my God, that, that, that high level of gatekeeping that oh, keeps out a lot of neurotypical people is usually often keeping out basically all autistic people. And the crucial thing is for no good reason. The gatekeeping that takes place in an interview is often totally irrelevant to the actual job that the interview is for. And that's where the problem really lies. So let's look at some of the details. Well, first of all, you've got that initial issue of an interview, which is the um, the unknowability of it, the, 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 the walking into the unknown that it represents. Um, if, it, if, if the organisation or company isn't willing to let you do it from home, you know, over Zoom or something, then you've got that whole thing of going to a strange place, maybe even a strange town or city, um, going to a building you've never been to before, um, negotiating around, you know, how to get into that building and how to get to meet the people and meeting these people for the first time. Now, this is all stuff that's, you know, documentedly difficult for autistic people, uh, far more so than I think non-autistic people. Um, yeah, there are things that we can do, and I'm sure we do. You know, we use Google Maps, you know, we look at uh, Street View and that kind of thing, and we do our best, I suppose, to, to, to mitigate that stress. But a lot of the time, that stress isn't mitigated by the, by the organisation. You know, they don't put much work into making things better. If they were to, then they might do really nice, useful things like send detailed emails um, explaining exactly how to get to the place. Not in that kind of, you know, if you're arriving from the station, we're, you know, about a mile away, but really exhaustive detail. Like, you know, go through these doors, go to this desk, ask for this, um, which is really useful, especially if it's combined with pictures as well, you know, showing you what these things look like. That can really help an autistic person, I think, you know, in, in a new situation. But we often don't get that. But even if we do get into the situation of the interview, even if we manage to get there and we, we, we manage to get into the right place and the right building and the right, at the right time, those first impressions are often a bit of a killer because, of course, they're neuronormative, neurotypical first impressions that seem to matter. And the reason that autistic people might trip up here is, well, I mean, I'll just take some hypothetical examples. Um, we might not make eye contact especially because it's an unusual situation we don't know these people and we're stressed so even if we're even if we're good at masking even if we uh, we force ourselves to make the eye contact usually in this key situation that might be beyond us you know we might not be able to because it's so stressful it's an interview our you know, ability to live independently might depend on this very circumstance. So the stress is enormous. So even if we usually can make eye contact and mask, we might struggle to. And of course, how's that judged? How's that viewed? Well, it's viewed in the most negative way possible a lot of the time, I think. Um, you know, it's, it's seen as being untrustworthy, shifty, blah, 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 blah. All this incredibly negative stuff is pinned onto the inability to make eye contact. So immediately, an autistic person is at a disadvantage. Because, you know, the people interviewing, the people doing that 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 role might, just might not know about autism, they might not know, or they might not care. You know, they, they just might not care. But even if, there's, even if that is overcome, there's often an expectation of physicality, isn't there? Which is so weird. Like, why? But, you know, shaking hands is... is seems to be a, just a an inherent instinctive um, reaction in those circumstances for, 
for you know the, the interviewer will will you know thrust out their hand expecting you to take it and you know do the thing that you do and again totally pointless i can't don't think i can stress that enough there's there's no inherent benefit to that like you know unless the job is <clears throat> literally predicated on the strength of your hand grip you know then then it's it's of no consequence whatsoever and yet if you were as an autistic person to be like whoa <laughs> no thanks then immediately you know that's another little cross against your name isn't it hypothetically so we haven't even got to the interview yet and pretty much we're already screwed then we're put into a very stressful situation um you know even more stressful we, we, we might if the if the organization if the organization is on the ball we might be given a detailed kind of schedule of, of, of what we're going to be doing over the course of the next few hours which is very useful but to be honest that will be much better in advance i don't think anyone is harmed by giving that information in advance um as a reasonable adjustment for example but we might be asked to do all kinds of things on a kind of spur of the moment uh in a spur of the moment situation which is, again, not necessarily going to be an autistic person's forte. You know, I, I think it's fair to say that very often we're, we're good at doing things when there's a bit of time available and we can give our give it a bit of thought and, um, and do things, you know, at the speed that feels comfortable for us. But, of course, in an interview situation, that's not available. So you go into the actual interview itself, uh, question and answer, you know, that quick cut and thrust. Um, if you're not given the questions in advance, then you're at a disadvantage. If you do the typically autistic thing of pondering a question for a time, you know, um, autistic processing speeds of questions can be slower, just because that's you know the way things go. Um, then you 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 know that that <laughs> I, I've found in the past that leaves a silence that I'm perfectly happy with. I'm sitting there just kind of formulating my response, but that silence hangs heavily over the neurotypical people in that situation sometimes and and it can again make a kind of social awkwardness which again if you're unlucky could be another cross against your name you know that's the thing so much of this interview process is based purely on social stuff um social expectations that may very well be completely irrelevant to the job in hand how many autistic people don't get a job that they would fit into brilliantly because they just couldn't nail those social expectations on the day, even though they're, they're, they're of no importance? You know, there, there is a reason why, you know, we, we might struggle for employment, and I believe that's one of them. If you are an employer, and if you do establish interviews, and if you want to interview neurodivergent people fairly, and with equity, then you have to adjust things. And one of the biggest things you might have to adjust might not be anything physical or, or schedule-based or anything like that. It might just be your own expectations, your own expectations of behaviour. They're the thing that need to be adjusted most. You know, that sh subtle shift in your mind of, okay, this person isn't making eye contact with me. I can either assume the worst and think that they are shifty and untrustworthy and lying, which is a bit of a jump, to be honest. Or I can remember that neurodivergent people exist, that autistic people exist, and that therefore some people really don't like making eye contact, and that that is not a problem. It does not reflect ill on their character whatsoever. Take that choice. Adjust your judgment in that direction. They don't want to shake my hand. I can choose to be mightily offended by that, or I can choose to think to myself, perhaps, perhaps they are neurodivergent. And I say that because somebody will always say, well, how are we meant to know? We might not know yet. They might not have disclosed. And of course, yes, that's very true. So just have it as a default that you share this planet with people who have different brains to you and therefore in a situation where somebody behaves in a way that might not strike you as the common way make a fair assumption that maybe then you're a divergent rather than oh my god this person's rude and horrible and I don't like them that's the adjustment that needs to happen if more people were aware of the fact they share the planet with people that think differently 
then these behaviours, these autistic behaviours, if you like, would not be viewed as unusual at all. They'd be viewed as just another part of life's rich tapestry. Um, and therefore, you know, and not something to worry about or, or to be offended by or to make snap judgments of. They would just be a standard part of life. But we're not there yet. We're not at that point yet. And it's going to take a lot more uh, of autistic people like myself and those, you know, many other fantastic autistic and otherwise neurodivergent advocates that spend all their time and energy trying to inform and get this information out there. And, you know, it's it's hard. It's hard. Maybe things are improving. Um, we will we will see. Um, but yeah, if you are an interviewer, then that adjustment of expectation is probably even more potent than, than anything else you can adjust. Having said that, you still want to be offering home interviews, you know, do it from home, do it over Zoom, unless you really can't for some good reason. Um, give the questions in advance if they want them. Um, and give that you know, detailed level of information about what to expect, where to go, what time to be there, how long it will take. That's a big thing, actually. Just, you know, just, um, you, often I remember when I was a teacher and I used to go to teaching interviews, there was never a sense of how long am I going to be stuck in this weird school that I'm not familiar with? You know, am I going to be here all day or am I going to be leaving at 2 or 12? You know, what can I expect? So be blooming clear, you know, say, yeah, you'll be done by two. You'll be done by two, so you can book your public transport or whatever it is you need, or you can, you know, you can be confident that you're going to be home in time for your dinner, which is part of your big routine, which you have to stick to. That makes a big difference too, doesn't it? So many things, so many things. Anyway, there we go, interviews. Um, a horrible thing that could be so much better with just a little bit of work on the part of those doing the interviewing.